Thank you. Okay. Now, what I mean by scope and scope perception here is what does HyperS15 deal with? What type of revenue does it deal with? In fact, on that, on that item one alone, a question can come out there. A question can be set on what IFRS 15 deals with. IFRS 15 deals with revenue. The name is revenue from contracts with customer. Uh, what type of contract with customer? It deals with revenue from sale of goods or services where you are. Um, for items that you are selling in the ordinary course of the business, for an item that you are selling in the ordinary course of the business, yes. For the items that you are selling in the ordinary course of the business. I'm sure you know that IFRS 15 replaced IS 11 construction contract, IS 18 revenue, and four different interpretations. And that is what makes it loaded because it's more or less as if you replaced six different accounting standards. So you expect it to be loaded. So what are those items that are revenue in nature, but they're outside the scope of IFRS 15? You need to know that renter income. Renter income is a revenue for a company uh, whose nature of business is to be renting out building as a lessor on the operating lease. Which accounting standard do you think applies to the revenue from renter of assets, building, and what have you? Oh, yes, 40. No. IS 40, IS 40 deals with, if you are using fair value gain or loss on investment property, you have fair value gain or you have fair value loss, IS 40 will tell you to recognize it in pure hell. But that investment property, are we together? The rental income you are getting from there. Which accounting standard talks about it? It's IFRS 16, listen. It's IFRS 16 that deals with that. So for an entity whose ordinary course of business is to be renting out buildings that it owns real estate property, then the revenue relating to that is, is governed by what? IFRS 16 and not this IFRS 15. Likewise, if you look at an insurance company that has premium income, although IFRS 4 is outside the scope of ACC syllabus, and likewise IFRS 17, but premium income will be insured completely outside the scope of this revenue. Likewise, if you have dividend income, that is covered under IFRS 9 financial instrument. If you have interest income, that is covered under IFRS 9 financial instrument. So a bank, its revenue is interest income, and it is IFRS 9 that actually covers that, not the standard. So you can see a scenario where the examiner is examining your knowledge of that. The five-step model. The four step says identify the identify the contract with the customer, right? The second one says you should identify the performance obligation, right? The third one says you should determine the transaction price. The first one says you should allocate the transaction price to the performance obligation. And the fifth one says you should um recognize revenue so that model is iidr model under identify the contract with the customer i'm sure you guys were told so many things such as 
there is no contract if either of the two parties can walk away in a wholly unperformed contract, right? And for you to say there is a contract, five condition must be met. I'm not going to be going to the detail of that today, but I'm sure you know those conditions because the examiner can test them indirectly in a scenario. Anything, anything, any accounting standard can be examined in any scenario based question. You know those five conditions. And what happens if, still under step one, I'm talking about now, what happens if you have been paid in advance? You've started delivery on the contract as the seller, but we are saying the five conditions are not met. They say you should continue to recognize revenue. I mean, you will not recognize revenue for the money you have collected. The money you've collected in advance cannot be recognized as revenue until substantially all the performance obligations have been delivered and the, the money you have collected is not refundable. It is under that step one that we talk about contract modifications. Contract modification is another thing entirely on its own because contract modification simply means change in price, change in scope, or change in both of them. And contract modification could lead to about two or three scenarios. One, it could be a continuation of the existing contract. Two, it could be that the old contract is terminated and a new one is established. Depending on what you modified, all those things are in the handout that you have or the textbook that you guys have read or that you are reading. So contract modification is still under the first step. Aside from contract modification, you equally have combining contracts. Must you account for every contract one by one or do you have to combine? So we are told that subject to meeting certain conditions, you must combine, not that you can combine, you must combine two or more contracts that meet those criteria. The second one is to identify the performance obligation, which is PO, right? PO simply means the performance obligation. And that represents the promise that you have made to the customers to transfer distinct goods or services. And you were told the meaning of distinct goods or services it must be capable of being distinct. You know what that means. Then two, it must be distinct within the context of the contract. Each one of those things is elaborated and I'm sure you know that. So aside from the performance obligations, so once you have one performance obligations, uh, then there is nothing special you will do in step four. But if you have more than one performance obligation, then you, you need to do something in step four. Identifying performance obligation is one of the most important steps in this IFRS 15. The third one is to determine the transaction price under which the about four things that you need to study or understand. Under transaction price, you, you learn about variable consideration that is consideration that is not fixed, that is capable of changing. The set, and you, you equally learn about the need for you to constrain the estimate of variable consideration. Con, you should constrain, constraining variable consideration means variable consideration should not be recognized as revenue. If it is, if it is highly probable that there will be a significant reversal in the amount of revenue you have recognized or you will recognize when the uncertainty associated with that variable consideration is eventually resolved. Then they told you about variable consideration in form of discount, the fact that you can allocate to one or more subjects to meeting certain conditions, variable consideration that is in form of, in form of uh, other variable consideration, then the fact that you can allocate to one or more subject to meeting uh, certain conditions. 
Another thing that you learn on that determining variable, um, sorry, the third one, surprisingly what I've been writing is not showing. Okay. So under the third step, you have four things. Variable consideration and constraining the estimate of variable consideration. I've talked about that. The second one is um, consideration paid to the customers. They say you should use that to reduce the amount of revenue unless you can establish that you have paid that consideration to acquire distinct good or services. Another thing, again, you learn on that, the third one is non-cash consideration. When you sell goods or service to customers and you are being paid not in cash, you are being paid not in cash. At what value should you recognize your revenue? They say it should be the fair value of the good or service you receive. But if that cannot be determined, then you use the standalone selling price of the item you have sold. Then the last thing there is significant financing component, which occurs when there is a time lag between when money is received from the customer and when good or services are delivered to the customer. And that could create a scenario where you will have interest income or finance costs. I'm sure you've dealt with that, depending on who is receiving finance and who is providing finance. So those are the four key things you learn under the third step, which is to determine transaction price. Variable consideration and to constrain the estimate of variable consideration. The second one is um, a consideration paid to the customer. The third one is non-cash consideration. And the fourth one is significant financing component. All of these, you learn them and you learn so many things. The first step is to allocate the uh, transaction price you have in step three to the performance obligations. You see what standalone selling price as a basis of that allocation to the performance obligation. And like I said before, you will have to allocate when you have more than one performance obligation. How do you determine the standalone selling price? So there are three approaches that we have the residual income approach, the residual approach, the uh, adjusted market assessment approach, and the, the, the one that you have to add the gross margin. And the last one is to add, which is to recognize revenue when or as you satisfy performance obligation. And then you will have been told that performance obligation could be satisfied at a point or over time. IFR 15 says you should first identify or determine whether PO is satisfied over time. By looking at three criteria or factors or conditions, if any of the three applies, it means performance obligation is satisfied over time. One of such conditions is the entity creates or enhances an asset that is being controlled by that customer as the asset is being created or enhanced. What does that mean? If a customer asks the seller, such as, a construction company to come and build a house on a land that belongs to that customer. A customer has asked a construction company to come and build a house on a land that belongs to that customer. So the construction contract, the construction company, how will they recognize revenue? Is it over time or at a point? If you look at that condition that says the customer controls an asset as you are creating or enhancing it. Because you are building the, you are constructing the building on a land that belongs to the customer. So everything on that land belongs to that customer. So you can conclude that as you are creating the building, which is the asset, that asset is being controlled because it's on a land that belongs to the customer. 
So you can be recognizing revenue over time because you have made that condition. So you have the two other conditions there. But if you look at Boeing, let's say British Airways has entered into a contract with Boeing to produce an aircraft. The aircraft may take some years to produce. As Boeing is creating the aircraft, can you say British Airways is controlling that aircraft as it is being created? The answer is no. Because <laughs> that aircraft is being created in the premises of Boeing. So you have the other two conditions. And the last, so if, if you are able to establish that PO is satisfied over time, the revenue should be recognized over time. Otherwise, you re recognize revenue at a point in time. That is it. And the standard tells you that it gives you about five con uh, instances that helps you to determine when um, a PO is satisfied when control of the good or service is transferred to the customer. So it gives you about five conditions. One of them is risk and reward. The other one is ownership of the item has been transferred. So those are the five steps. Those are the five steps. And there are other things you need to learn in terms of if you are recognizing revenue over time, which approach will you use? Input and output approach. Those are the two options open to you to be able to measure progress. Aside from that, you learned about contract costs. Contract costs. And contract costs include one, cost of incremental cost of obtaining the contract, which we were told that should be um, uh, capitalized if it can be recovered. However, the cost of fulfilling a contract they said IFRS 15 say first determine whether another accounting standard applies. If yes, apply that another accounting standard, e.g. IS2 inventory. But if no other accounting standard applies, then rec recognize it as a cost to be capitalized and amortized over the period you will earn the revenue over a time provided three conditions are met. And one of the three conditions is um, that cost relates specifically to an identified contract, which can be recovered. There are other things that you learn under FRS 15, such as sale with a right of return. You have sold good to customer, and the customer has got the right to return the good back to you within a given period of time. What should you do? You were told not to recognize revenue fully. You need to use historical experience coupled with expectation of what will happen. The portion that you expect to re the customer to return, you will have to recognize it as what? As a liability, a return liability. The cost of that item that you are sold to the customer as well, uh, you want to recognize asset for it. You will say asset of a return liability. You, you learned about warranties. Warranties. Warranties, you were told there are two types of warranties service type warranty and assurance type warranty. Assurance type warranty is within the scope of IS 37, right? But service type warranty will constitute a separate performance obligation. That is what you were told. Principal versus agent. How do you determine whether you are an agent or whether you are a principal? You were told about that as well. You know the principal will recognize revenue at gross. Why the agent will only recognize commission? So it's very important you should identify whether you are a principal or an agent um, simply by looking at what the standards say. The standard makes it clear when it was amended. IFRS 15 was amended, I think, about two, three years ago to reflect that you are a principal, you are an agent if you control that good or services before it is transferred to the customer. Once you can identify that you control it, then you are a principal. You are a principal, rather, if you control the good or services before it is transferred to the customer. 
But the moment you can say that you do not control the good or services before it is transferred to the customer, then you are, you are actually an agent. What do we mean by control? Control is the right to direct the use of something and benefit substantially from it, and the right to prevent others from directing the use of that item. The right to direct the use of an item, a good, an inventory, and benefit substantially from it, and also include the right to prevent others from directing the use. But the standard now gives some other factors that help to complement that understanding of whether you control or not. For instance, you determine who bears the inventory risk, who bears the credit risk, who has the latitude to determine the price. All those things will help you to determine whether you control that item before it is transferred to the customer. Option for additional goods. This occurs when you have sold, let's say, you have sold milk to a customer and you are giving that customer the right to come and buy maybe another product. And you're giving that customer a coupon to say, come and buy maybe butter. If you come to buy butter within the next 60 days, I'm going to sell it to you at a significant discount, provided you come within the next 30 or 60 days. The question is, the money you've collected for the milk you have sold now, it includes, you can recognize everything as revenue because there is, you have given an option to come and buy additional goods. And that you need to do a calculation and take a portion of the revenue relating to that milk and put it aside because you have given that person what we call material right, which is the right to come back and buy butter. I'm sure you've done all this. Customer prepayment for official goods or services and customers on their exercise rights. Customers on their exercise rights is what we call breakage. Break, breakage. What is customers prepayment for official goods or services? For instance, if you look at airline, you go and buy a ticket, right? You buy tickets, uh, it could be that you are going to fly in, in, in two weeks' time. But you've bought the ticket today, they've collected the money from you, say $5,000 to fly. What happens? Will they recognize it as revenue on the day you bought the ticket? The answer is no, they will not recognize it as revenue on that day. At what point will they recognize it as revenue? That is when the aircraft has landed at its final destination and they have the evidence that it has landed safely. That is when they will recognize the revenue. So for all the airlines, that is exactly what they do. So if you have bought ticket $5,000 from British Airways, for instance, the amount they collected from you, they will debit cash and credit contract liability. That is what they will do. Until you have shown up, you have been conveyed by that aircraft, and the aircraft has landed safely. That is when they will recognize revenue. What now happens in two weeks' time if you don't show up? If you don't show up on the day you are supposed to fly, does that mean your money is gone? The answer is no. Your money is not gone. So what if you don't show up that day? In most cases, if you look at those air tickets, you have the right to come back at a later date to come and use them. You have the right to come back at a later date. They can say valid for one year. But you know, the same way you have failed to show up in two weeks after buying the ticket, which is the day you are supposed to fly. There are many people too that fail to show up. The question then is, at what point with, assuming there are about 100 people that fail to show up, that day, multiplied by 5,000, that is a whole lot of money. Does that mean if the valid validity period is one year, BA should wait until the end of that one year before they recognize revenue? The answer is no. If they are able to have 
experience that out of this hundred people, out of this hundred people, there is about 30 that will not show up and they will forfeit the right to use that ticket at the expiration of one year. For the other 70 that you know will show up, you will not recognize the amount they, you collected from them as revenue until they show up and they use the ticket and the aircraft has landed. But for the 30 that you know will never show up, that is what we call breakage. That one you will recognize it systematically as a revenue over that one year in proportion of, out of that 70, as they start showing up, if today five people shows up, then you will recognize that five divided by 70 multiplied by the revenue collected from those 30 people. You will recognize it as revenue. That is what Aquarius 15 said. No refundable upfront fees. That, of course, when maybe you are joining a club or you are joining maybe a society and they say pay this upfront fee. Or maybe you are listing on a particular exchange and they're asking you to pay a fee, a listing fee, which is not attributable to any service they will render to you in the future. The question then is, that organization that is collecting that upfront fee from you, at what point should they recognize it as revenue? Is it immediately or over a period? That is something that FRS 15 is not explicit about. And sometimes they may say that you may have to recognize it over the contract period. But that, what if that contract period is indefinite? Does that mean you, you recognize that amount, spread it over that indefinite period? License of intellectual property, software vendors, music producers, film producers, the revenue they are getting from all those things, how will they recognize it? I'm sure if you have done license of intellectual property, you will have seen there are two types of right, right to access and right to use. Right to use exists at a point. Revenue should be recognized at that point. But right to access exists over time, and revenue will have to be recognized over time. How will you know whether it's a right to, to assess or right to use? IFR 15 tells you that subject to meeting certain conditions, then it will be a right to assess. Well, if those conditions are not there, then it means it to be a right to use. Repurchase agreements. Repurchase agreement occurs when you have sold an item. It could be an inventory. It could be an investment property. It could be a PPE. You've sold it, but you've got the right to buy it back. Or you have an agreement to buy it back. I'm sure you will have been told that it could come in three different ways. It could come in form of move forward, which is obligation to buy it back. You must buy it back. Number two, it could form, come in form of option, put option which means the other party has the right to put it back to you and you must buy it. And the third one, it could come in form of call option, which means you are the one that have the right to buy it back. The accounting treatment differs depending on the situation you are in. And the accounting treatment also depends on when you are buying it back at what price versus the fair value then versus the sales value now. Consignment arrangement is a situation where maybe let us look at Toyota that is based in Japan. If it has shipped some goods to Nigeria, for you to sell under an arrangement that we call consignment, which means you will not pay Toyota until you have sold. If you have deposited any money, it's just a guarantee. And if you don't sell, you will return the motor vehicle to them or transfer it to another vendor based on the directive of Toyota. In that case, that means the control of that item has not been transferred to you. So Toyota cannot recognize revenue when those motor vehicles are moved to you. 
bill and hold arrangement of course when you have build a customer you have transferred good or service to customer you have transferred the you have built you have raised the invoice you have given it to the customer but we are still seeing the goods in your premises can you recognize revenue this is an area where fraudulent financial transactions can occur you are claiming to have sold the goods that we are seeing in your factory how can you claim that Friday 15 says subject to meeting certain conditions you can recognize revenue subject to meeting certain conditions. I'm sure you know those conditions. So those are the things under FRS 15. Those are the things under FRS 15. I would like to go, I'm looking at time. I know I have a couple of questions I've sent to you on FRS 15. Um, but if I solve those questions now, I won't even be able to touch on this FRS financial instrument. I'm just thinking I should, exactly what I've done now, so FRS 15, I should do same on FRS 9. Then subject to time, we can now solve some questions. What do you guys think? I agree. I think it's okay. Okay. Financial instruments, they are three. Please go, everyone should go back on mute. Financial instruments, there are three accounting standards. You have IS32, which is financial instrument, excuse me, presentation. You have IFRS9, which is simply financial instruments. And you have IFRS7, which is financial instrument disclosures. Often time, and over time, I've never seen the examiner examine IFRS 7 because it's a pure disclosure standard. IFRS 7 is one of the standards that make financial statement to be bulky. Financial statement under IFRS used to be very, it's, it's usually very bulky. And one of the things that makes financial statement to be bulky of voluminous is this IFRS 7. Is this IFRS 7? Um, so examiner is not likely to examine it because he has actually not been doing that. Okay. I stated too that this with financial instrument is the one that defines financial asset, financial liability, and equity instrument. Only equity instrument has a straightforward definition, which says residual interest in the asset of an entity after deducting what all liabilities. Financial asset doesn't have a straightforward definition, likewise, financial liabilities. IFRS 7 tells uh, I stated too tells you that instrument issued. How do you know whether it's a financial liability or an equity instrument? It will tell you that it's a financial liability when you have the contractual obligation to deliver cash or another financial asset to another entity, then it is a financial liability. Or you, you are going to exchange financial assets or liabilities with another entity under conditions that are potentially unfavorable, then it's a financial liability. But if you issue an instrument and you do not have the obligation to pay cash or to deliver another financial asset to another entity under conditions that are potentially unfavorable, then that instrument is what? It's an equity instrument. A good example, a good example is in this. In, in many parts of the world I've seen, when you issue ordinary shares, many people think the name ordinary shares is what makes ordinary share to be an equity, an equity instrument. No, it's not the name, it is the features. When you issue ordinary share, I'm sure for 
is the same in all the countries that are represented on this lecture today. When you issue ordinary shares, the others, the investor in the ordinary shares, they do not have the right to cash. You as a company, you do not have the right obligation to pay cash. Dividend, it's only when you have declared dividend that you pay. If you have not declared, no, no shareholder can say you should pay. And if a shareholder who has bought shares is no longer interested as a shareholder, the best he can do is to sell to another interested party. But that shareholder cannot compel you to buy as a company that issues the share. That is what makes ordinary share to be what? An equity instrument. It's not the name we call it. So if you see an ordinary share that they say there is an obligation, you must pay dividend. Then you should know you are beginning to see a financial liability in the name of ordinary share. And uh, you'll know that some preference shares are equity and some preference shares are financial liability. Irredeemable preference share is an example of financial liability. I mean, an equity instrument or a preference share that is only redeemable at the option of the issuer is another example of an equity instrument. Compound financial instrument was the one we saw today in the question when we saw that uh, convertible, which is convertible at the option of the older. So I've told you that type of compound financial instrument has equity and liability. And again, you were told that, you were told that at that compound financial instrument, you need to do the separation into equity and liability, which is what we call split accounting. The equity component goes to equity, while the liability component becomes a liability to be measured subsequently under FRS 9. Share issue costs should be charged to equity. Share issue costs should be charged to equity. In Nigeria, we charge it to share premium. If there is no share premium, you charge it to retain any. If we still have the people from Ghana here on this call, I'm sure they can confirm that in Ghana, there is nothing called share premium. Because in Ghana, it, the law, the company's law in Ghana does not require the shares to have what we call nominal value or per value. So there's nothing called share premium there. So in a country where there's share premium, that is oftentimes what they, where they charge share issue cost. But if there is none, then there is, you can charge it to any other company of equity. That is why the highest stylishly uses the name equity. Anywhere that is permitted for you to charge it to in equity, charge it there. Treasury shares represent the shares of the company that the company has bought back. The, com the shares that you have bought back, you have not canceled it. That is what we call treasury shares. It's called, in the group account, it also represents the shares of the parent bought by the subsidiary. In the individual financial statement of the subsidiary, it will be treated as a financial asset. But in the group account, it has to be treated as what? Treasury shares. IFRS 9. IFRS 9. IFRS 9. That is the main thing. I'm, it appears the slide is not changing. It appears I'm still saying I32. Let me know if, if the slide is changing at your hand. Yet to change. Still on, I it's not changing. Let me see if I can change. If I can change the internet. Let's see whether this one is better. I've just changed the internet.
I'm not sure it's, it's not showing at your hand at all, right? No, not it's not. Showing now. No. Yeah, blank attempting to show. I hope this one is not worse. This one looks uh Okay, let me see. Let me stop sharing and, uh, and start sharing again. Okay. I'm sure yes, you can see now it's now. okay. Okay. Yes, it's okay. So IFRS 9, not too many definitions there. Eh? <laughs> I think there is there is a mistake there. Applying equity method of accounting shouldn't be there. That is a mistake. That is a mistake. And not too many different scope and scope exception is what type of S9 applies to, what it does not apply to. That is including executory contracts. Executive contract is a contract where you have entered into an agreement to buy goods or services and you have not paid money to the supplier and the supplier has not transferred goods or service to you. That is an executive contract. You have entered into an agreement to buy a good or service from the supplier. You have not paid in advance, and the supplier has never transferred any good or service to you in advance. That is an executory contract. At first night, we apply to it if that contract can be settled net in cash or settled in, in as if it is if um, if financial asset except when you are entering into that contract to, to buy it for your own use. If that item you are buying, that good or service you are buying, you are buying it for your own use, then it will not apply. Recognition of financial instrument, you were told that financial instrument should be recognized in your book once you become a party to the contractual provision of the instrument. Once you become a party to the contractual provision of the instrument, then recognize the financial asset in your books, right? And recognize the financial liability in your book. Let's now look at recognition, rec initial measurement. Initial measurement of financial asset or liability depends on how it will be subsequently measured. I'm sure you know that. Initial measurement of financial asset or liability depends on how it will be subsequently measured. For those financial assets or liabilities that will be subsequently measured at fair value through or hell, initial value should be fair value only. Transaction costs must be expensed. However, for the financial assets and liabilities that will be subsequently measured at fair value through P or hell. Fair value through P or hell. I'm sure you know what it means. For the financial assets and liabilities that will be subsequently measured at fair value through P or hell. The initial value should be fair value only. Transaction cost must be expensed in pure health. But for the financial assets that will not be subsequently measured at fair value through pure health. Now I'm not taking liabilities and assets together. For the financial assets that will not be subsequently measured at fair value through pure health. 
e.g. those to be measured at fair value through OCI and those to be measured at amortized cost subsequently. The initial value should be what? The initial value should be what? Help me out. Fair value plus transaction cost. Fantastic. Fair value plus transaction cost. For the financial liabilities that will not be subsequently measured at fair value through P or L, i.e., those to be subsequently measured at amortized cost. The initial value should be what? Help me out. The initial value should be what? Deducted. Less transaction cost. Less transaction cost. Fantastic. So that, that closes that episode of initial measurement. Then you talk about subsequent measurement of financial assets. Hmm. You know that thing is better and well thought when you use a diagram to do it, right? If you use a diagram, you will be you will discover that financial asset could be a, a debt instrument. That is one. Two, it could be a derivative financial asset. Three, it could be investment in equity. All financial asset meant all financial asset would, would be any of those three. Debt instrument, derivative financial asset, or investment in equity instrument. If you say debt instrument, can someone give example? Example of debt instrument that are financial assets. What are they? Investment example in government bonds. Okay. Yes. Continue. What of trade receivable? Where will it from? Trade receivable is a financial asset. It will be it will be debt instrument too. What of placement with banks? The money you have in the bank, it will fall under debt instrument. Yes. What about loan receivable? It will fall under debt instrument as well. It will fall under debt instrument. Are we together? So that is that is about that. Derivative financial asset will always be measured at fair value through your health because it will not meet it will not meet one of the tests that you need to carry out, which is called. SPPI test, solely payment of principal and interest, otherwise known as contractual cash flow characteristics test. It will not meet it and it will always be measured at fair value through pure health. You know that the meaning of fair value through pure health means at the end of every reporting period, you measure it at fair value. Fair value gain or loss will go to where? Pure health. So derivative will not meet the SPPI test, solely payment of principal test because it doesn't give you cash flow in form of interest and principal, it must be measured subsequently at your value through pure health. What of investment in equity instrument? If you are holding it for trading, if the purpose of holding it is for trading, then it should be measured subsequently at your value through pure health. But if not, you need to make an irrevocable decision to measure as fair value through OCI. If you opt for that option, you will measure it subsequently at fair value through OCI, meaning that fair value gain or loss will pass through where? OCI. It will not go through POL. And eventually, when you sell that financial asset equity instrument, the fair value gain or loss that you have passed through OCI that is sitting in fair value reserve in your equity will not be reclassified or recycled back to POL. But if you are not using fair value through OCI option, then you measure it at fair value through pure health. Debt instrument that does not pass the SPPI test must be measured strictly at fair value through pure health subsequently. But the one that passes the 
SPPI test, you find out under which of the three business models does it fall. Because you have the business model which is to hold and collect, and that is to be measured at amortized cost, you have another business model which is to hold and sell, hold and collect and sell, and that is to be measured at fair value through OCI. And you have another one which is to hold strictly to sell, and that is to be measured subsequently at fair value through POL. So you need to know that which of the three business category, uh, three business model that financial asset is carried. That is about subsequent measurement of uh, financial um, assets. Subsequent measurement of financial liabilities, oftentimes is at amortized cost. Oftentimes is at amortized cost. But well, you have few financial liabilities that include one, the one you are holding for trading, including derivative, they must be measured subsequently at fair value through P or L. Then two, the financial liability that is not held for trading, but you have designated it at fair value through P or L. Such type of financial liability must be subsequently measured at fair value. But the fair value gain or loss will be separated into two. One, those that the fair value changes are attributable to the general change in interest rate in the market. That fair value change should go to P or health. But when the fair value change is attributable to your own credit risk, whose credit risk, the credit risk of the issuer of that liability, then that type of fair value gain or loss should not go to P or L, it should go to where? OCI. Unless recognizing it in OCI, we increase or enlarge what we call accounting mismatch, in which case it should be recognized in P or L. Before the recognition, there should be impairment, which is ECL, impairment of financial instruments. That is another loaded area of uh, IFRS 9, ECL, expected credit loss. Um, you need to know which type of financial assets um, should be tested for impairment. We don't test investment in equity at all. Any financial asset that is measured at fair value through P or L, you don't test it. It's only debt instrument that is measured at one amortized cost and two, fair value through OCI that should be tested for impairment. Then also, there are two other things we tested for, we test for impairment. One, loan commitment, which is not a financial asset, undrawn loan commitment, we test it for impairment. Two, financial guarantee contract, we test it for impairment. Also, Assets and liabilities created under FRS 15 revenue and FRS 16 leases. We test them for impairment. For instance, trade receivable is, a con is an asset we create under FRS 15. If you think about it, what gives rise to trade receivable? You sell on credit, you credit revenue, you debit trade receivable. So you are creating trade receivable under FRS 15. Contract assets. If an asset you create under FRS 15, again, we test it for impairment here under FRS 9. Lease receivable under FRS 16 in the books of the lessor, whether operating lease receivable or finance lease receivable, we test it for impairment to under FRS 9. And you learned that there are three approaches. You have this general approach, which has state one, state two, state three. And you have the second one, which is simplified approach. And you have the third one, which is what we call POKI. What is POKI? POKI is purchase or originated credit impaired financial asset method. That third approach only applies 
when you are dealing with a financial asset that is credited peer from day one on the day you originated or on the day you bought it it is credit in peer it was in peer from day one for that type of financial asset you use what we call poci metal otherwise known as pokey but the examiner is not likely to test that third one the examiner will test the general approach which is a three-stage approach and it will test simplified approach Simplified approach can only be used for one, listening and listening good. It can only be used, simplified approach can only be used for one, trade receivable and contract asset without significant financing component. You know, we've done significant financing component today. We talked about it under FRS 15. So contract asset or trade receivable without significant financing component you must use simplified approach. However, for the following nine terms, you are at liberty to choose between simplified and general approach. Which items? Number one, contract assets and trade receivables that have significant financing component. That is number one. Two, Lease receivables under FRS 16. Lease receivable under FRS 16. So for those one, you are at liberty to choose between general and simplified approach. The simplified approach has three stages. Stage one, where you apply 12 months expected credit loss. Stage two, you apply lifetime expected credit loss. Stage three, you apply lifetime expected credit loss. You can, you were told, or you learned how to move from stage one to stage two, from stage two to stage three. And you learned that you can move back from stage three to stage two, from stage two back to stage one, right? You learned all those things. You learned, for the people I taught in, for the people I taught in one of the two classes, I I actually I actually um, trying to remember. I actually defined credit loss first. I illustrate, I demonstrated it by way of figures. I now added the word E to it, which is expected credit loss. I illustrated I by way of figures. I illustrated the meaning of 12 month expected credit loss and lifetime expected credit loss. But for simplified approach, there's nothing like 12 month expected credit loss or lifetime. It's only lifetime expected credit loss for simplified approach. And when you are using simplified approach, often for trade receivable and contract asset, you are permitted to use what we call provision matrix, which is a practical expedient. Practical expedient means, yes, we are just allowing you to do this as an easy way out for you. And that is when you group trade receivable based on what? Based on maturity date. Uh, sorry, the days pass due, the days pass due the days pass deal. I told you for the general approach, if a financial asset has become 30 days credit pass deal, you can move it to state two. And if it has become 90 days pass deal, you can move it to state three. You were told all those things. You were told all those things. Um, you were taught how to calculate ECL. How to calculate ECL. Um, I taught you for the people I taught, again, I taught you the meaning of that ECL, if you are using formula approach, ECL simply means, um, ECL, sorry, expected credit loss, otherwise known as impairment loss, IL, impairment loss, equals what? LGD times EAD times what? PD. 
And I've seen this being used in the examination question. I told you the meaning of LGD means is loss given default. That is, on every $1, what are you going to lose? If they say your LGD is 30%, it means on every $1, if default occurs, you are going to lose 30 cents on every $1. LGD can be given in ratio. If they say 0 0.3, it means 30%. It can also be given by way of percentage, which is 30%. EAD is the exposure at default. It means the, the, the amount of exposure that you have that, that is subjected to credit risk. What is credit risk? The risk that the person owing you that is supposed to pay you cash will fail to pay and you will lose. What is PD, probability of default? The probability that that person will fail to pay, that is what we mean by uh, loss given default. I mean PD rather. So after ECL, we talk about the recognition. One may be thinking that the recognition is a simple thing. Oh, impairment of financial instrument is even here. I didn't even know. So I've taken it already. The recognition of financial asset means you cannot remove financial asset from your book until when? Until you have seen, uh, you've met the criteria. And the criteria is you have either sold it uh, or transferred it together with the risk and reward or the right to receive the contractual cash flow as expired. And we look at example of when you will sell or transfer and risk and reward will remain with you. And when you will transfer and risk and reward, we move. The recognition of financial liabilities, we said you should recognize when the obligation has been extinguished. The recognition is, is another highly examinable area. We talked about derivatives. Hmm. For some people, we've not talked about derivative. What is a derivative? Derivative is a type of financial instrument that meet three features. I will say that again. Derivative is a financial instrument that meets three features. Anything that meets these three features is likely to be a derivative. Number one, it requires no initial investment. It requires no initial investment. Or if it requires initial investment, the initial investment requires is usually very insignificant compared with the amount that you will have invested in similar type of contract that changes in value, like that uh, derivative. So the number one feature is it requires no initial investment. Or if I thought it requires initial investment, the initial investment requires very small. There are four types of derivative for those who know it very well. Number one, you have option. Number two, you have forward. Number three, you have futures. And number four, you have swap. Of the four types of derivatives I've mentioned now, forward, futures, and swap they do not require any initial, initial investment. Forward, futures, and swap. Typically, they do not require any initial investment. But option, option is the only one that requires initial investment. That is why the first feature says, it requires no initial investment, talking about forward, futures, and swap, or initial investment that is very, very small compared with what you will have paid on similar type of contract, that is option for you. In the case of option, in the case of forward futures and swap, the two parties have obligations. But in the case of option, one party has a right, the other party has obligation. You know, when it comes to insurance, when you insure your motor vehicle, if the motor vehicle is stolen, you have the right to go to the insurance company to go and compel them to replace your motor vehicle, you have the right. And you have the right to forgive them as well. So, because you have a right. But the insurance company doesn't have a right. It has obligation. So if you exercise your right for the motor vehicle to be replaced, the insurance company must replace it. 
the insurance company has got no right. So for you to get that right, you know you pay a premium. You must pay a premium for you to get that right in the case of insurance. The same thing applies to option. For you to get that right as the holder, you pay a premium. That is what we mean by that small amount of initial investment. So the one that pays that premium to acquire that right is called option holder. The one that has the obligation to perform if the option holder exercises his right is called the option writer. In the financial world, the option holder is called the long, long as L-O-N-G. And the option writer is called the short, S-O-R, S-H-O-R-T, short. That is in the financial world. There are two types of options. You have the, um, the call, which is the right to buy, and you have the put, which is the right to sell. Call option, as C-A-L-L is call option, the right to buy. Y-P-U-T, put, is the right to do what? the right to sell. So the first feature. The second feature of derivative is the value of the derivative changes in response to the change in the value of the underlying instrument. The value of the derivative changes in response to the change in the value of what? Underlying instrument. Underlying instrument can be anything that changes in value. Stock price changes on daily basis. Yes, that can be an underlying instrument. Bond price changes on daily basis. Yes, that can be an underlying instrument. Exchange rate between dollar and another currency changes on daily basis. Yes, that can be an underlying instrument. Floating rate such as LIBOR that is being replaced changes on daily basis. Yes, that can be an underlying instrument. Anything that changes in value can be an underlying instrument. So the value of the derivative will continue to change as the value of that underlying instrument is changing. So derivative is like a shadow. As you are walking, the shadow is walking along with you. If you bend, it bends. If you stay in one place, the shadow stays in one place. That is the second feature of the derivative. The third one is, it is usually settled at a future date. Anything you buy today and you settle today can never be derivative. Derivative must be a, a something that will be settled at a future date. Those are the three features of derivative. For derivative, you will see that it is usually measured at fair value through fee or health. So when you have derivative, it could be an asset, it could be a liability. The derivative you have today could be an asset, tomorrow it could turn to a liability. And derivative is said to be a zero-sum game. Why? There are two parties. If it is a gain for one, it is a loss for the other one. And when you sum the gain and the loss, it gives you zero. If party A is gaining 10, party B is losing 10. If party B is losing, is gaining seven, party B is losing seven. When you sum them up, it gives you zero. Take note, derivative is usually measured at fair value, fair value gain or loss goes to pure health. That is about derivative. Not sure whether there's any question. Embedded derivative is the derivative that is not standing alone. It's not standing alone. So if you enter into option forward and futures, you know that what you are entering into or swap is a derivative. But what if you enter into something and you don't know what you are entering into is a derivative. It is not a derivative, but it has element of derivative inside. That is what we call embedded derivative. So in the case of embedded derivative, the instrument that harbors the derivative is called the host contract. The instrument that harbors the derivative is called what? The host contract. Or the entire instrument together with the derivative is called hybrid instrument because it has the host, which is not the derivative, and it has the embedded derivative. What is the requirement of IFRS 9 with regards to contracts that have embedded derivative? According to IFRS 9, it differentiates between 
the host contract that is a financial asset and the host contract that is not financial instrument. A good example of host contracts that is a financial that that has embedded derivative listing guys is when you invest in a convertible bond, you invest in a convertible bond. What you have has embedded derivative. Remember, we have take, we have talked about convertible instrument, but we looked at it in the books of the issuer. So if we are looking at it in the books of the investor, if you invest in a convertible instrument, that instrument you, you've invested in has what? Embedded derivative. If you invest in a callable bond, what is a callable bond? A bond that the issuer has the right to call back prior to maturity. It has embedded derivative. If you invest in a putable bond, which is the instrument that gives the right to the holder, the investor, the right to put it back to the issuer prior to maturity, that is a putable bond. So those are examples of financial instruments that will have what we call embedded derivative. You can also have a contract that is not a financial instrument, e.g. a contract to sell, a mere sale contract. Imagine a seller that is based in Nigeria selling something to a buyer that is based in US. So you have the seller here in Nigeria. The currency in use in Nigeria is Naira. You have the buyer based in US, the currency in use in US is US dollar. What if you sell and your invoice is not denominated in Naira, which is your currency? Your currency is not, the invoice is not denominated in US dollar, which is the currency of the buyer. Assuming it is denominated in, in Japanese yen, which is a third currency. It's denominated in Japanese yen, which is neither the currency of the seller nor the currency of the buyer. You will be wondering, why will I invoice the buyer that is based in US? Why will I invoice that buyer in Japanese yen? You know, the reason could be that what I'm selling, I'm buying it from Japan and I need Japanese yen. So rather than invoicing in Naira, in which case I need to take that Naira to the market to buy Japanese yen, or rather than invoicing in US dollar, in which case, when I collect the dollar, I have to take that dollar to the market to buy Japanese yen. I can arrange that contract in such a way that you will pay me Japanese yen. So if you pay me Japanese yen, I don't need to go and buy Japanese yen again for the import I want to make from Japan. You know the risk there, I've eliminated it completely, the exchange rate risk there. So inside that contract to sell, you have embedded derivative inside. The requirement of FRS9 is for host contract that is a financial asset, there is no need for you to separate. So if you invest in a callable bond, a putable bond, or a convertible bond, that type of financial asset will not pass SPPI test. It will not pass it and you must measure it at fair value through your health. But for a debt, in, for any other host contracts, like the sales one that I've talked about now, or a financial liability that has embedded derivative, you must separate if and only if you meet three conditions. If and only if you meet three conditions. Those three conditions, I'm sure, uh, depending on whether you are reading textbook or handout, you, you have those three conditions that I don't want to go into that. That is embedded derivative. The last thing is hedge accounting. What is hedge accounting? I've really used, let me use this play. Hedge accounting. Hedging means to, to, to mitigate, to reduce or to eliminate. Hedge accounting simply means designating one or more hedging instrument in such a way that you are able to offset the cash flow or the fair value change of the hedged item, either fully or partially. So when you are doing hedge accounting, hedge accounting, 
there are two ingredients of hedge accounting. The first one is the hedged item. And the second one is hedging, hedging instruments, hedging instruments. What is the hedged item? It could be an asset, it could be a liability, it could be a highly probable forecast transaction, or it could be um, um, a, a commitment, a firm commitment that exposes you to the risk. Hedge item is what exposes you to the risk. What type of risk are we talking about? Financial risk, e.g., currency, currency risk, e.g., interest rate risk, e.g., uh, price risk. That is the risk that the price of a financial asset could come down, it could not die. So these are the risks that you try to mitigate. So what exposes you to that risk is the hedged item. And what uh, you are using to mitigate the risk is what we call hedging instruments. Hedging instruments are mainly derivatives, mainly, but not all the time, derivatives. But what, how do we, why are we even studying egg accounting? There are two types of Edge, edge, edge relationship that you are expected to know. Fair value hedge, hedge, and what? Cash flow hedge. Fair value hedge, and what? Cash flow hedge. In the case of fair value hedge, it's simple. Fair value gain or loss on the hedging instrument goes to P or hair. Fair value. Fair value gain or loss on the hedge item goes to P or L. As simple as that. For fair value hedge, fair value change in the hedging instrument go to P or L. Fair value changes in the hedge item go to P or L as well. With the exception of when you are hedging investment in equity that is measured at fair value through OCI. It is only that one that the fair value gain or loss on the hedging instrument will not go to P or L. It will go to where OCI. For the cash flow hedge, the fair value gain or loss on the hedging instrument that is determined to be effective goes to OCI. And the ineffective portion goes to where P or L. If you have seen the format of a typical consolidated statement of P or L and OCI, you will see that under OCI, you will see that cash flow hedge gain or loss, you will see it under items that will be subsequently reclassified to P or L. It is the effective portion of the fair value gain or loss on the hedging instrument that is considered to be effective. Why the ineffective portion goes to where? P or L. So the effective portion goes to OCI and the ineffective portion goes to where? P or L. That is just to summarize financial instruments in few minutes, in few minutes. IFRS 16, unfortunately, I'm not sure I'll be able to do that. These are the things you have under IFRS 16. Scope and scope perception, definition of time, identifying a list, which is key. List, list accounting, that is how you should account for list in the books of the list. Uh, we, we use a single model, which is to recognize right of use asset and liability. Don't forget the liability and the asset may not equal each other. They may equal and they may not equal each other. Uh, the only exception is uh, with regards to recognizing right of use asset and the corresponding liability is when you are dealing with short-term lease and lease of low value asset. Short-term lease is a lease that is 12 months and below, while low value asset is a, is, is a lease that the value of the asset is considered to be low. And at the time the ISB issued the standard, they said the value they had in mind was $5,000. Lesser accounting is another area and we did sale and lease back. That is all about that. That is all about that. I have a lot of questions that I would have loved to solve, a lot of them, plenty of them. But my suggestion is this, unfortunately, 
even if I start solving those questions under FRS 15, under FRS 16, under FRS um, um, 9, and I 32. <laughs> All those questions I loaded there, it may take us like, like another half, four or five hours to finish all of them five hours that is if we are even fast so my suggestion would be that you can see there is a colleague of mine that want to take current issues um he doesn't have enough time but i would like him to come in and talk to you on current issues which is another thing that can be examined in question four. So look out for current issues in question three or four. Um, the, what I would like to say is that I have solution to all these questions. All the questions I have down there for is 15, 16, and nine, I have solution. I would have loved to solve all of them with you because the, aside from the fact that I will solve it, I will explain some things, you will ask questions, but unfortunately time will not permit that. So I will allow my colleague to come in and let's see what he can do to deal with current issues. But I promise you the solution to all those questions will be sent to you. If you have any issue, please feel free, feel free to reach out. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know if there are questions for me before I take my take a bow and leave. Thank you so much, Jamie. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if Saeed is in the class. Thank, thank you, you Saeed. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Saeed, are you in? Sorry, let me reach out to Saeed. Because the current issue is something that I don't want you guys to, even though it doesn't have enough time, but let him even show you some things. I've not, I'm not seeing the screen. Okay, I'm still showing it. I'm still showing it. Actually, I've not seen it since the beginning in the since we came back from the break since 4 p.m. I've not seen the screen. Wait, let me stop sharing. It must be your network, but let me stop sharing. I'm trying to reach out to Said. I can. Hello, Jamil. Hello. Yes. Okay. So while you are trying to reach out to Saeed, I just have a question, right? Why um, do we have to part with cash when going to the CBM? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Saeed, can you join the class? Okay, yeah. No problem. Yes, join the class. Yeah. Okay. So go ahead. I'm, I'm okay. listening. To yeah. Okay. So I mean, the question just sent us around the fact that when the banks go to CBN for derivatives, right? They part with cash as, as against what we, I mean, for forwards now, they part with cash as against our understanding of what the derivative market is supposed to be. For some reason, I'm not sure why we are able to, I mean, I've asked severally and the answers are always different. Fantastic. You have asked a very fundamental question, a very fundamental question because in the definition of derivative, one of the three features uh, three features says it requires no initial investment. Are we together? Or if at all it requires initial investment, in initial investment that is usually very, very small. And I've told you that happens in the case of option where you pay a premium. So, like you've rightly said, when you are talking of non-deliverable forward where you know that maturity, the other party will not even deliver that foreign currency to you. And sometimes you, are, you have paid the whole amount. The, the Naira leg of it, you have paid everything in advance. 
Okay, so not deliverable means you are not delivering anything. For that one, you may not pay advance payment. But for some that you know that you are going to get the dollar, they ask you to pay the Naira leg at once. The question you are asking is that, would that meet the definition of derivative, right? Yes, that is the question. And why do they have to take cash up front? If there is a specific, is it a country specific regulation? You know, the answers are always hazy when I ask these questions. So I just okay, want to get to you. What some people have said is this. The Naira you are paying is possibly not going to CBN. It's going to the um, clearing house. You know, there are some, Nigeria is gradually maturing to the level that we have clearing house, which serves as an intermediary between party A and party B. Are we together? And it is that clearing house, which is in Nigeria is FMDQ, Financial Markets Dealer Quotation, that is collecting that Naira, provided, I'm just saying it on the surface. If you go deep down, if that is not the case, then uh, it could be another thing. So if, if there is party A, party B, if the money being paid, because what I understand is, is the two of them, party A and B, that will contribute that money or pay money. And they are washing it. You know, derivative, the value changes. Someone may be gaining, the other party will be losing. The party that is losing, it could lose up to a time that the entire amount that you have put there is wiped off completely. And so they may call upon you again to bring additional money. So they said that money you pay is not initial investment. It's a security to ensure that if that contract moves against you, you will not disappear. You know, derivative, some people consider it as an evil thing. Some people don't even do derivative at all because they believe that there are many organizations that have collapsed because of derivative. If you Google Barings Bank of blessed memory, Barings Bank, it was a 235 years old bank. It was brought down by a man called Nick Lesson simply because of reckless trading in derivative. So uh, to ensure that, because we've said it's a zero-sum zero game, if one party is gaining, the other party is losing equal amount. The party that is losing could see that, oh, this is a loss. It could disappear. To ensure it doesn't run away, that money you are putting down is a security being managed by the clearinghouse, which in Nigeria is an FMDQ, to ensure that the two parties perform. Is that clear? So on the strength of that argument, they believe that amount you are paid is not the initial investment. I don't know whether I'm communicating. Yes, you are. Thank you very so much. So they claim that it's not the initial investment. It's just a security to ensure that when that contract moves against you, you will not run away and say you are not. And you know, the moment you see a lot of participants in the market reneging on the contract, failing to perform, then that means the integrity of the market will be put to test. So thank you very much. I believe Saeed has joined now to quickly take you through our uh, current issue. Saeed, are you there? Saeed, are you there? Hello, Saeed. I'm still not hearing Saeed. Maybe in case you have any other question, please feel free to ask me. Let me call him again. In case you have any other question, feel free to. Hi, you've not joined? No, sir. Yeah, I'm joining. I'm from the lobby. Just for someone to write me to admit. And you don't need. You don't need to be. I'm not seeing you in the lobby. Yeah. Because you are Jamie, supposed to please enter. mute.
हेलो 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 वी कैन हियर यू या वी कैन हियर यू गो अहेड सो आई वांट टू आस्क अ क्वेश्चन एंड माय क्वेश्चन इज फॉर द केस ऑफ कंबैटिबल डेट्स or any form of convertible security is it possible uh that you convert it to uh let's say an asset like uh um, bitcoin a cryptocurrency instead of um, shares hello hello good evening everyone if hello good evening sir he is good evening good evening sir thank you as everything i uh, okay thank you <laughs> it has been a long day Oh, sorry about that. Okay, so the class is ending by what time? When you end. <laughs> when so I club, end. It's not when you end. It's when you close. Eh? Seven. Six p.m. Nigerian time. Seven o'clock. My what time did I end class? What time? Twenty-five minutes nine, more. Nine. Seven seven o'clock my time. No, okay, immediately you, before ten. Are you fine with seven o'clock? Six p.m. is what is that? Is, can time? you talk to the administrator? Immediately before ten o'clock. Six p.m. This class is ending six o'clock. Six p.m. Not seven o'clock. Not not six o'clock. Six p.m. Six zero zero.